Welcome back to Talk Time with Max Contact. I'm your host, Sean McIver. Today's episode is a masterclass in innovation. We're discussing Spoken AI, our exciting, exciting new speech analytics product. But more importantly, we're here to share the entire journey. This is not a sales pitch from spark of idea to successful launch. In just 12 short months, Spoken AI went from concept to reality, with its first client going live in just the space of two weeks. That's some serious innovation speed. Joining me today to unpack that journey is Ben Booth, CEO of Max Contact, and Matthew Yates, VP of Engineering. Ben, as you know, I don't like to do big introductions for people when they're sat on the call with me. I'm going to go to you first. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, no problem at all. So um, I'm Ben Booth. I am the CEO of Max Contact. Um, I've been working in the contacts and industry for over 20 years. Um, my story and journey through to this position is I started on first line support. Um, and I've been involved in over 500 plus implementations when I was an implementation engineer all around the world um, in various use cases, which gave me great insight into the actual workings and what goes on in the contact center space. <clears throat> Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and, and yourself, Matt? Hi, Sean. Um, yes, myself, Matt Yates. Um, so I've worked in technical companies for over 20 years now. Um, had the pleasure of working with some great teams over the last 20 plus years. I uh, found myself at Matt's Contact, working with another great team. And I'm really passionate about working with technology to solve real problems and ultimately help customers improve their day-to-day -day lives um, through whatever med that may be in terms of the problems that we solve. And obviously in the contact center, I mean, there's many opportunities to help improve the lives of those that uh, use our platforms and solutions within the contact center. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, for those who don't know, um, the people on this call are the CEO of the boss, uh, the, the, the bosses of the company I work for. So I'll try not to mess this one up. So let's get stuck in. Talk to us about Spoken AI as a concept. How did you come up with the concept? What was the gap in the market that that, that you saw and, and decided there's an opportunity there? We always had a vision uh, when we, we we came from a reseller background. And one of the reasons uh, we decided to build our own software was to actually to create exciting, innovative, but technology that actually delivers value. Uh, so does uh, not just marketing actually truly delivers value and not, not work as expected is the one I used to say. Uh, so work as expected, not as marketed. So we, we had a plan always as a vision to move into AI even years ago. And but it became this an inception point of one, a new wave of technology, which everyone's aware of, but the technology has already always been there. Um, the cost um, came down for the implementation of like ASR, so speech to text. And then the increasing demand with the market, um, global market economy and macro events that we're going through. So XA speech analytics isn't new and AI isn't new in the sector, but there's been a drive to improve for efficiencies, increase productivity, but I would actually say even more so unlocking the value of data. And historically analytics products uh, are quite cost prohibitive, especially upfront costs and total cost of ownerships, which we'll get onto today. Um, but all these three things, maybe even four or five things came together at the same time that said, right, this is the perfect opportunity to accelerate this now and actually produce something that could build a real value. And from your point of view, Matt, how, what would you say to that? Um, or what would you add to that? So when I joined Max Contact um, just over two years ago now, well, it's flown by, um, Ben shared with me the, the vision for the Max Contact product and platform. And part of that vision was to move through a number of phases, three phases, and the second phase is automation, moving towards leveraging AI in the third phase and building on the foundation of data that we have available to us. Um, so one thing that really excited me about you know this opportunity was like Ben touched on, you know, we've got literally thousands upon thousands across our clients of call recordings and translating those call recordings into actual data, transcribing them into actual data, which we can then start to analyze and generate insights to drive, you know, efficiencies in the contact center, drive, improve customer experience, help the outbound sales teams operate more efficiently and effectively. That was really exciting. Um, and so, you know, I do remember, you know, when I was sat in the office with Ben, just over two years ago now, around about Christmas 2020. Two, yeah. um, and yeah, we were kind of sat in the office, and he was taking me through this, and, and that's really what caught my attention uh, because I love data, 
I love analytics. I love finding insights within data to drive improvements. And so really, you know, like Ben touched on, we've got this huge amount of data that was untapped. You know, it's kind of effectively a data goldmine, if you will, that we weren't really doing very much with uh, beyond offering up to clients to listen back to the call recordings um, via the audio call recordings. And so, yeah, I think the, the culmination of the technologies to support spoken AI, as it's now referred to uh, in the product, you know, the automatic speech recognition technologies, you know, the advancements made, particularly around the open source AI models, um, both large language models and non LLMs, and compute associated with those as well. The efficiencies around, you know, the ability for us to actually execute these models and transcribe um, effectively at a, you know, a cost efficient rate really kind of culminated in this opportunity for us to, to get started. So the vision was there, and then the, the technology matured to the point where it made it you know, possible to to enter the market. And, you know, very important for us and our clients is to ensure that we offer value for money. And, and so that's why throughout this whole project, you know, cost has been a key consideration, um, as has obviously quality and performance and everything else. But, you know, cost was a key consideration for us to make sure that we can offer these solutions to our clients, at, you know, an attractive price point that delivers real value to them. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that's something that, um, f- from my point of view, one of the things I'm proud of is, is exactly that. It's the fact that, you know, the, the, the result that we've got is something that is feature rich at a reasonable price point. So moving on from that, then, um, Matt, I'm going to switch a bit more focus to you for a bit here. So the decision is made by the business. Here's the gap in the market. We want to identify, you know, we've identified this. We want to move into that area. How do you begin even going about the development process? And where I'm coming from with this, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of put an anchor on this a little bit, is, you know, Ben's experience, you know, 20 plus years in the industry, my experience, the industry, that the knowledge that we have, our domain knowledge is very much within contact centers. And AI as an entity is maybe not necessarily our, our home base, if you like. We have an awareness of it, but it's not necessarily our home base. So how did we begin that journey? So one thing we didn't do and we never do is we never jump straight into coding up the solutions that we think are the best fit for the the problem. The first thing that we do is we start what we call a discovery phase. Uh, And during that discovery phase, we explore the feasibility of, is it something we can build? Is it something actually we should partner with a third party provider with us to help us provide those services that we need to offer up as solutions to our clients? Um, Can we build it in such a way that it's usable? You know, in 2024, you know, usability, the user experience is absolutely one of the number one factors in whether a software application of any kind will succeed. And so, you know, the technical feasibility, the usability, the the business viability. So we looked out there. There were already established speech analytics providers out there, um, some really great solutions. Uh, indeed, we we were reselling, you know, one or two of those solutions as well. So there's really good solutions out there. So we're able to assess the market, assess the usability, assess the technical feasibility. And as part of that discovery phase, we embarked upon a lot of research. Um None of us were experts, and nor would I say we, we're still experts in artificial intelligence and data models. So it was important that in order for us to build a software application in this space that our customers will trust and base business decisions off the back of, that the data is good and sound. And that data, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, is audio recording data in the first instance. So we transcribe the audio recordings into text so we can run the analysis. So the first step there was to identify the right service, the right tool to enable us to do that automatic speech recognition, that um, speech to text conversion. And we didn't have these skills in house. So we engaged with uh, an industry expert um, several months ago now, middle of last year, early last year. Uh, And he came in and really helped us with his expertise and we embarked upon an evaluation 
looking at a number of different speech transcription vendors. I uh, went through a very extensive evaluation process looking at you know the key factors when it comes to speech transcription, like you know word error rates, diarization rhization error rates, performance. Can we operate this solution at scale, for example? Um, and so he really helped us get started and identify a speech services vendor that we could work with. Um, and indeed, now we've incorporated that solution into our own solution. We host and run it ourselves in-house on our Microsoft Azure platform. So discovery along that, we got the data. And in time, we will start to incorporate you know, email and web chat and digital interaction channel data into the solution as well. But we made the decision, the conscious decision, to start on the use case that applied to pretty much all our clients use voice. Um, and so it was a use case that was applicable to all. So as part of that discovery process, you're looking at the feasibility, but you're also looking at what is the problem that we're trying to solve you know, fundamentally, you can have the greatest idea in the world and, you know, people could, yeah, we need to start using AI. But if you don't have a real business problem to solve, then are you going to come up with a viable solution that people are interested in at the end of the day? Probably not. So, mm-hmm. you know, we focused on a pain point in the contact centers and that pain point is quality assurance. So quality assurance and gaining operational insight into what is happening across all your calls not just the two to maybe 5% of calls that free speech analytics you would evaluate via listening back to the audio recordings, uh, but now you've got access to evaluate 100% of all your calls in the contact center. So that was the use case we identified. We did the initial research on the technology that was going to underpin our whole journey with AI based, based on the quality of the data being good and yeah we kind of took it from there and worked iteratively as we always do we work in short sprints you know we, we aim to fail fast and learn you know so like i said none of us were by any stretch experts within this space um we're all learning every day um so we got the industry expert in to come and help us on the automatic speech recognition aspect and really kind of got to the point where we engaged with ux we had ux skills on the project started to create some mock-ups of what this new solution might look like, started to get that in front of clients. Uh, so we run what we call a design partner program. And that basically means that we engage with a number of our clients from our existing customer base and get their feedback. Again, to make sure that all the solutions we build solve real-world customer problems and they're going to be usable by our clients. And so, yeah, a little bit long-winded, so apologies for the, the lengthy answer, and I could carry on talking on this topic. But, yeah, that voyage of discovery started and got us to the point where we had enough confidence in the problem, our ability to solve it, our ability to, to provide a great user experience, you know, at a good price point. We then embarked upon the actual implementation phase of actually building out these uh, application and AI solutions. Ben, coming back to you for a moment, just off the back of what Matt's just outlined, obviously this is an enormous undertaking. As a CEO of a a business, obviously it's exciting and looking forward is always an exciting prospect. Was it daunting undertaking this journey? You know, a new product, new domain space, new technology, new everything. What was the the mental gymnastics around the risk assessment of like? that like for you you know are we talking like sleepless nights or was it actually no i understand this let's go yeah no i'm a firm believer and we're going through a weird transition and our business is going through a transitional period at the moment we've had three years of curveballs thrown at us left right and center um and i probably view risk more now than any point in my career when we're making these type of decisions because you know we almost it's it's fine saying uh, we don't fail, we learn. But when there's a big budget behind it, um, you can't keep learning those lessons. So, um, I, I mean, to touch on Matt's points, to summarise, I mean, we, we talk about this a lot and I almost got it in my head where we, you know, there was a lot of validation that went through that. You heard him talking about reviewing the market, clients. And when I think about these big things that we take on board, I almost have a Venn diagram in my head. And it's one, capability. Do we have the capability to build it? And we look at the people, the skills, and we brought some extra skills in to help with that problem. We now have the capability to execute do the clients want it? Is it is it a, sort of probably solving a problem? Is it something they can pay for? Is it delivering value? What's the roadmap going forward with it? Is it a one-off? So we look at our capability, what the clients want. And then one of the third ones a bit is actually passion. 
Uh, have we got a bit of a passion for it? And when those three things tend to come together, when you in all the things we've ever built as Max Contact, um, I think you, 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 the risk is reduced. Don't get me wrong, there is risk. Um, and we spent a lot of time, we mentioned 12 months. There was about three and a half months before we wrote a line of code uh, of investigation, research, prototyping, Matt, Matt mentioned getting prototypes as early as possible in front of clients for validation. So there's a lot that goes on when you, you're doing these projects, especially ones that you are a bit passionate about because it can it can blur your vision on reality. Like Matt, there's plenty of good products and better companies out there that failed. Um, so you do need to make sure because we have that duty of care to everyone in the business um, that we make sure we pick the right one. So yeah, no, I, I did. We spent a lot of time on it, um, but that time actually, as you go through the process, if it is the right decision, should build your confidence as you're getting towards the end of it. Um, and that's where we got to. So we got to that point. I have that rule. People hear me talk about it in other podcasts or whatever. That 40, it's meant to be 47. If mine's 40, 80. So once you, if you're 40% confident, com, if you're not 40% confident, you don't know enough. But if you're over 80% confident, you've waited too long. And we were getting to that 80% where the clients were saying it delivers value. Everyone we speak to wanted analytics products, but either couldn't afford it or had been burnt in the past for usability. Um so we were in a really good place and we thought we could execute well and um, with the skills we brought in and the team we had uh, and that's contact. So yeah, no, it, risk is definitely a factor. It doesn't, it does worry me and it should do as well. Um, otherwise I think you become reckless. Um, so, but we, we did everything we could to validate and that's what the team did here and they did a great job as well. Speaking of the actual design journey itself now, as we embarked on that validation process, um, I want to take a moment just to touch on the, the UI, the UX element of it, the user interface. Now, I have insider knowledge because I know you were both involved in those conversations as they were ongoing. In terms of that user interface that we came up with for Spoken AI, what were the most important elements from your point of view? Was there anything that surprised you the most um, that, you, that you perhaps didn't anticipate? And what was it and why? Um, Matt, we'll come to you on that one first, if we can. Sure. So we set out, we had a brainstorming session very early on, um, close to when we wanted to actually start to build out this solution to determine what our design principles were, um, you know, or our guiding lights as we embarked upon this journey to build our first AI powered solution. Um, and, you know, things like using cloud native technologies so that they are performant, they're scalable, you know, security is fundamental. You know, we're dealing with data here. So making sure we're GDPR compliant, we've got the correct data handling in place. And from a usability perspective, making sure that the, the user experience was as simple and intuitive as possible. Um, we wanted to provide a great out-of-the-box experience. So you don't have to, as an end user, go in and spend a bunch of time configuring the system in order to get value from it. You should be able to log straight into the system and be provided with insights that are relevant and useful for your organization. And those are the real kind of guiding principles, specifically around UX. Um, we put a big emphasis for the first release on making sure that, you know, you would have, so as soon as a new client signs up to Spoken AI and they've got access, they can log into the portal for the first time, that they are presented with insights that they can very quickly understand and very quickly, this is one of the other guiding principles, literally within three clicks and in about 10 seconds, go from thousands and thousands of calls worth of data and drill right down into either an individual, a team, a particular topic, a particular call duration, you name the filter you want to apply, drill down right into a focus area within that large data set that you can then understand the behaviors within those conversations taking place in that smaller data set. And you can get actionable insights to help drive, you know, coaching within your contact center to help understand from an operational perspective, what's happening across my calls in the contact center, what's happening in this particular team over here, you know, lots and lots of insights, but you can do so literally within three clicks and under 10 seconds. Uh, and that was one of the fundamental aspects for me. Uh, ben, your thoughts? Yeah, look, we've we've all used products we don't like using that do a job. Um, I, I think there's plenty of software out there when SaaS became um, big 
the UX was a second consideration. It, it is as long as it works and you can make it do it, then that's a, a tick in the box. Um, but I go back to a lot of studies where I think we're in this period now, I think there's a stat where it's 75 plus percent of uh, buyers have buyer's remorse when they bought software. And typically it's not because the software can't do what they want it to do, it's because they can't make it do it because it's complicated, it's hard to use. Or then it's professionals, you have to go and pay for someone to, to do it because you have to be an expert and done uh, 10 years of experience. And uh, it's fundamentally wrong. Um, and especially with the technology that's coming today, with Gen AI as a good example, um, one of our core principles is you should be able to unlock value of what the, the software delivers. Um, uh, and that, when we when we look at the data we have in a contact center, and any product can do this, we have lots of data anyway, when we when we introduce analytics, we're just giving the end user more data. How how are they getting answers from that when they just get more data thrown at them? So one, we needed easy setup. Um, you need to deliver value straight away, but that data also needs to be interpretable and and, and meaningful. So um, otherwise, you know, again, the, the products are failing. It, it's got to deliver that value, and I think, like I said, we've all been through those learning experiences, and none of we wanted to make sure we didn't make the same mistake. So it's a guy. It, it sounds like a low level priority for a lot of products actually we feel it should be one of the highest it's interesting that you talk around the the decision making process through that context matt i guess coming to you um can you walk us through so the the, the broader decision making process behind spoken ai's maybe even just initial core functionality how did you go about prioritizing features ensuring they addressed the the relevant most pressing customer needs so i'd say as with any you know, software development project, you begin, begin by understanding the, the problem. You identify the problem that you want to provide a solution for. We worked through the discovery phase. We identified that we could build a solution, a speech analytics solution, targeted at that QA function and providing operational insights. And from there, we start to build out what we call a product backlog, which is effectively a wish list of features that we believe we need to build in order to provide this solution. Um, and those features are what we then validate with clients in the form of the, the user experience mock-ups. Um, we validate that the features we're thinking about building, the types of data we want to present. So the conversation data, but breaking it down into sentiment, for example, extracting the topics. So you can very quickly see what topics are being discussed across your calls in the contact center. Um, and also summarization, providing a very quick way to so quickly digest the content of a long transcript potentially within you know 20 seconds of reading a very short summary um, so there's some key capabilities around ai that we wanted to incorporate and also from a ux perspective we had to build out the user interface and the application what was really interesting with with this as a project compared to i guess a more traditional software development project is that you've got that ai work stream as well and so you start to then think and have to understand and have the right skills to be able to operate what is commonly referred to as a machine learning workflow. So machine learning ops, ML ops in short. Um, so, you know, strong DevOps engagement, assisting the data scientists. There's a lot of technical challenges behind running AI models in production at scale. So you find a lot of people, we've seen, we've seen it over the last couple of years, it's very easy for anybody to go into chat GPT, get, go into open AI, start to experiment with GPTs, create a custom GPT, you know, and it looks amazing. You try and take that concept that you've been running on your local machine into a production environment, it's a very different kettle of fish. And you need the, the knowledge and understanding from an infrastructure perspective that needs to join up with the data science skills to ensure that we can architect a solution where we can run at scale, we can you know onboard new clients and scale up. We've got some really high forecast volumes we want to attain over the next 12 to 24 months. And so the initial architecture has to take that in, into consideration. So compared to a normal software development project where you're really focused on the application development, you know, front end, back end, user experience, user interface, you also now got this data engineering ML ops work stream as well which you need to manage effectively um, and obviously you need the data in order to provide the insights in the ui so there's a there's a scheduling aspect to it all as well 
So there's the, yes, you create a product backlog with all your features that you want to build the product, but then from a kind of a project management perspective, you've got the challenge of orchestrating all the work that needs to happen and coordinating it into deliverable increments that build towards the first release of Spoken Eye that we've seen, um, Spoken AI that we've seen, you know, over the last month. And we worked in two-week sprints. Um, so we worked in two-week sprints and made sure, you know, we had a tangible goal at the every at the end of every sprint. Um, I remember, you know, we had a lot of, in terms of the development process itself, we'd always have a, a sprint demo uh, and everybody in the company was, would be invited to that sprint demo because, you know, we want everybody to have the opportunity to provide input into that user interface. You know, I remember, obviously, Ben would often speak up and provide input into the user interface in the same way our colleagues in support would, or DevOps, or marketing would as well. So it was a real, I guess, team effort uh, in terms of generating the input into the feedback that we need to build the product, as well as engaging with real-world clients to get that feedback as well. So again, sorry, a little bit of a long-winded answer, but um, these are these are big, broad topics that you keep on asking me about. No, no, the, the, that's absolutely fine. Not a problem at all. The more detail that we have, I think the more valuable it is to get that depth of insight into these particular areas that can be really challenging. Speaking of challenging areas, perfect little segue there. Ben, so we, we created Spoken AI. We had this platform. We did the demos. We built the core functionality. We got the kind of the the... Not necessarily the buy-in, but the affirmation that we're on the right track from clients that we'd already spoken to. How do you go about bringing that to a an already busy and getting busier market? Was the positioning of it a challenge? Like, how did how do you approach that from a you know bringing a new product to market? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that side in the research phase, because we had to do a market review and see, is, is there a gap? Are we entering a market where it's pointless entering the market? It's, it's too overcrowded. And in the same way, when we built Matt's Contact, it, it actually, we found out it's a, it's a still a similar problem. And it's and it, um, with the way markets turned recently, it's, the problem's still there for a lot of vendors. In the RICP, is your sub 500 c contact centre, we have bigger but it's a very underutilized, underserviced market. One for, we mentioned um, technical skills and onboarding and that total cost, you know, PS cost of continuation isn't, isn't actually feasible for a lot of sub 500 seat um, contact centers. So the ICP was there. Um, it wasn't too dissimilar from our, our, our current ICP that we sell. That isn't to say it's di it is slightly different because we some of the investigation we found is, is there's there's other opportunities and this is the one thing with product development we had a nice roadmap of how we think things was going to play out we got to our release two and release three has already changed based on research and client feedback and we'll I'm sure we'll talk about that later um so what it happens and this is the importance of getting your mvp out first is because you learn you just start learning even more um and i think we positioned it well, it's you have to stand out from the crowd when we talk about marketing. How how do we stand out? How are we different? What's our USP? Why we're we buying your product, not someone else's? Is it all the common questions I always get asked? Um, and again, it comes back to our ideal client profile is the sub five hundred. It's still SME. It's that easy of ease of implementation. All those guiding light principles that we settled on was from that. How do we stand out from the crowd and why we are different? Um, and that's how we got to them. And we stood fast by them. Um, so far, so good, I will say. Um, but the other thing there is, is we have you have to be adaptable and agile. So we only knew what we knew then. As Matt said, we do two-week sprints. That's every single two weeks we deliver value in the product. And every two, every two weeks we get feedback. Um, and we continue to do that now in live production, even more so now it's in live production. We actually accelerate that feedback with our customers. Um, and we're always learning and that will dictate the direction of the product and, and create value because at, at the end of the day, it's the clients that use it and they're the ones we're targeting. So there's a lot that goes on around it. Um, again, the research starts on day one and then it's just following it through and executing, to be honest. Well, good job so far. And, and I'll, I'll actually say the same applies to our other big project. The, the, it applies to all software projects. This isn't specifically spoken. It's, it is around it. But that um, I mentioned passion before. I think... It's underutilized when you do a project. If that passion is there, you tend to find um, these type of problems and challenges. Uh, the energy is there to solve them, and uh, it really does help. Thank you. 
Um, one of the key challenges, Matt, I'm going to come back to you on this one. Um, innovation inherently is challenging. There's a reason why markets end up that the way they are. There's a reason why you tend to lean towards kind of consistency or homogeny between products, certainly in terms of broad feature sets. What were some of the key hurdles faced during Spoken AI's development phase? Uh, and how did the team go about navigating them? So there were definitely a few, good few hurdles that we, we had to overcome. And the way we did that was, you know, one of our core principles as a company, actually, so taking a step back at one of our, some of our house values are that, you know, we work effectively as a team, that we're open and transparent. And that, you know, bleeds right through the development process as well. So where we do hit blockers and challenges, they get surfaced up and then we swarm on them as a team to address them and find the best way forward. And uh, we did exactly the same with, you know, this particular development project as we do for others as well. But in terms of specific examples, what I would say would be things like um, as we as we learnt about the different options for AI models to use for the different tasks. So there are really three tasks that we're looking at, topic extraction, summarization and sentiment analysis. Um, we embarked on quite a lot of research to determine, you know, are we best using an LLM? Because, you know, surely LLMs can do everything, right? You know, so are we best using LLM for sentiment analysis and for topic extraction? Um, and what we discovered during our research was actually there's better ways of extracting topics and sentiment than using an LLM. And actually those ways are not only more accurate, but they're more efficient from a, you know, a compute perspective as well. You know, so using some of the skills that we we have on board now the data science skills we're able to evaluate different options now one challenge with that is what point do you stop evaluating the number of options because there are a lot of options out there and you can almost spend a bit like ben mentioned 10 15 minutes ago you know if you get to 80 percent confident you probably spent too much time thinking about it before you made a decision you know, we, we were going down a path where evaluating four, five to six different models, all with varying pros and cons, uh, performance improvements, quality outputs, cost um, factors associated to them. And we had to kind of draw the line and go, right now, by this date, we need to make a decision in order for us to move forward on this project. And so putting some deadlines in place for some of the key decisions, particularly around the AI model selection, was one example of a challenge that we had. And, and I say another one would be, just to say um, on that as well, well you look at risk yeah. mitigation we built it in a way that if it wasn't the right model long term we can change it out so there's yeah. also make a decision but if we get it wrong it's not the worst thing in the world um yes it's not yeah. ideal, but this is the thing with the projects you've got those icon pivot points and you know always looking at risk always looking at mitigation but you also one thing that cripples businesses is, is you can go on forever with research you've got to make a decision and you've got to move on um yeah. so yeah it's a great example of it for me no, it's a great example. And, and you know, just for example, there we we're looking at you know, the new Llama three seven, so it's eight B model, Llama three eight B, and probably going to swap that out in the next few weeks as well because of the improvements that's uh, that's in that model. I think there's another example. Um, so we do use a generative AI um, output from a Llama model, um, and that is to do the call summarization. And so a challenge that we identified very early on, indeed a risk for the whole project, is the quality of the data and the quality of the AI outputs generated from the data. And what we saw during the early testing that we did uh, with the summarization outputs is there was a tendency to hallucinate uh, more frequently than we were comfortable with. Um, and so we devised a test data set, which we then had to review by humans, you know, so I was involved in that task. I know you were, Sean. We got some of the guys in support involved as well. Um, and we kind of almost did a bit of a swarm on the test data set to label it such that the data scientists could then train the model on what to look for so they wouldn't hallucinate in certain circumstances. And we significantly improved that um, false positive rate um, through the activity. And we've had to do that two or three times. And it's definitely something we will, as we do more with Gen AI, we need to do more and more of. So I think, you know, identifying the risk of using some of these AI models, particularly the generative AI ones, and then having strategies in place where you can very quickly retrain the models 
um, was one of our key learnings as well. I think certainly from my point of view, that's um, that's probably going to live with me for the rest of my career was the hours spent doing the ground truth validation around that output. Um, however, it was it was really important that we did that early on and that we ensured that we had that confidence level. Um, yeah. Just yeah, to that, kind of... if, if fact, one anecdote there, actually, Sean, you just reminded yeah. me. So Sean would ask, you know, the data scientists, you know, how many, how many uh, ground truth labels would you like me to do? You know, what what size test data set would you like me to uh, to label for you? As big as possible, please, a thousand plus. You know, so yeah, it made me laugh that uh, Sean, Sean didn't take all that on himself. We actually, you know, spread it across the organisation and share the load. But uh, yeah, we had, we had some fun times. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and I think that speaks to Ben's point as well around that, you know, the 80% confidence. Sure, we could have done thousands of summary reviews and ground truth sense checking. But as soon as we got to that point whereby, no, actually, we're confident enough that this is this is enough um, and we're, we're flexible enough, we can adjust if we need to once, you know, further down the road. Once those two checks have done, we, we were good to go. Um, and, it, you know, it was absolutely a team effort. Conscious of time, so I've just got one final two-part question for each of you, and I'll come back to you, Matt, to start. With Spoken AI successfully launched now and in the hands of customers, what accomplishment or aspect of the product are you most proud of? And then part B, as we look forward, what are you most excited about in terms of what's next? So the aspects of Spoken AI that I'm most proud of I probably have to pick a couple if I can <laughs> only choose one. That's too hard. Never, so never. one would one would be um, one would be the delivery. So you know, throughout my career, I've always been passionate about you know delivering value to clients uh, and delivering projects that deliver value to clients. So you know, to see the progress of Spoken AI during the development phase, receiving live client feedback during that development phase, and now actually clients going live on the solution and starting to gather feedback from the clients on you know areas they'd like to see improve but also what's working well for them um i love that you know that kind of drives me day to day but equally does working with great people and the team you know so i've just really enjoyed the last six to nine months working with you know a cross-functional team so not just a development team but obviously we've had ux in there but the traditional qa in there working with the data scientists over the period of time, you know, the architect involved in the project, uh, DevOps as well, you know, helping spin up the whole MLOps pipeline associated with this. And then, you know, internally, I think one thing that's been really enjoyable, we created what we call a GTM team, uh, go-to-market team, which is a cross-functional team within Match Contact, where, you know, marketing, sales, engineering, DevOps, support we'd get together on a regular basis mm -hmm. and just prepare ourselves for the launch so you know several months in advance of us wanting to launch this product we started to plan for it things like making sure we do knowledge sharing internally you know we had lunch and learn lessons lunch and learn se sessions at lunchtime for example where you know we take the rest of the company through the journey so far what's coming and when um, and, you know, various knowledge training sessions. You know, we had a Monday session, Sean, I, knew, I know you chaired, uh, just ideation around the departments, around what the next release might look like, what it might incorporate. So I think the whole process and the team and fundamentally the, the product we've delivered, yeah, I'm really proud of. Um, and I think everybody's done an awesome job and it's only just started. And that's the exciting bit for me is, you know, we've now kind of got that stake in the ground. We've got a good solid first release out there. We can now learn from the clients and we're now on that journey to really transform the contact centers using AI to drive efficiencies. And um, yeah, it's really exciting. Amazing. Thank you. And coming to yourself for your thoughts on that, Ben. Um, Follow that. Just every, everything Matt said, I mean, I was going to say very similar things, but for me, it's the people on the team. And, you know, one of the toughest things, and I think a lot of CEOs or senior people have in the career is realising or building, you want to build great teams and you it's about the people and you want to do that. Um, and watching them execute better than you could do actually gives you more pride than anything else you'll do in your career. So the, the whole... I talked before about the passion and it actually, that three a Venn diagram was a very recent thing I was thinking about. I'm sad to think about these things. And that got added to one of my key now 
um, subjects I'll talk about because, and with that, with that 8040s, these type of projects are about energy and passion and direction. And as, and seeing it executed the way it was and everything that was involved to launch, the effort to go in to launch a successful new product and deliver it to clients within two weeks of launch, anyone who's ever done software development understands the challenges that go with that. Quality as well, you training, your support needs to know how to support it. It needs to work in infrastructure, alerting, monitoring. There's all the stuff that goes in the background with software development that people don't see. And have the whole company um, watch what they've done and how they've did it, done it. And, yeah, like I say, realising that execution is better than when I'm involved. And actually, it needs to step away more. Uh, it's a hard thing to accept, but that makes it's also uh, proud. And like I say, that passion thing come from that, so it shows you the effect it's had on me. Um, so yeah, just 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 proud moment, and I think everyone involved needs to. Be, I've said it before. I was on the company meeting, proud of themselves and what they've done. Um, so yeah, great great project. Love being part of it. The energy, the excitement, the coming up with new ideas, which we're still doing. You know, as we're looking ahead, as I mentioned before, we had a roadmap that's already changing, um, and now with what we've learned of what we can do, and the what the technology can do, the ideas we're coming up with now for where the product could go is really exciting and I'm looking forward to where we're going to get to. And I'm hoping our clients are getting so excited as well um, because it really is when I mentioned the new wave of technology and why this inception point going back to the beginning was the right time is we feel we can build things now faster, quicker, but also that deliver more value than, um, let's say, a bit more archaic incumbent system. So really exciting time um, in software development. If anyone listening is in tech and software, it's they don't underestimate the power of that energy in your business for change as well. So great, great product, great achievement from everyone. Can't speak highly enough um, of how, what everyone's done. Amazing, thank you so much, um, Matt. Just to close us out, one minute as we look to the future. What's next for for what we've delivered so far? What's next in the spoken AI universe? So, in less than sixty seconds, we are going to build on our early expertise that we're developing around conversation intelligence. So you think about what we're doing, we're starting to really become experts at our ability to analyze large amounts of data, particularly conversation data happening in contact centers and elicit insights from that data. Those insights, think of them as trigger points and each of those trigger points we can use at multiple points within the contact center CCAS application. Um, so whether it's using them, you know, for post call wrap up activity, summarization, starting to use some of the insights we're generating, particularly some exciting aspects we're looking at now around things like the outbound contact center, um, objection handling, you know, understanding what are good responses to objections received, competitor mentions, starting to get a little bit of revenue sales intelligence in there alongside the more traditional QA call data quality metrics. Uh, but all those can be used not just for coaching and training purposes, but to drive sales strategy, you know, to drive the strategy of the business and also to drive automation workflows. So, you know, expect in future that Spoke and I will evolve. You're going to start to see it come into the contact hub for the agents to use. Um, and we're just going to drive more and more efficiencies, keeping, you know, people at the center of it and making sure that you know we're delivering value to to our clients ultimately so yeah really exciting yeah no i won't repeat what matt said i mean obviously the roadmap for spoken is, is very exciting but what what we've also done and i'm going to touch on again general software businesses our companies is that with what we've learned we've realized that that technology can bleed into the rest of the product faster so what we're also doing is we're doing sessions around with the knowledge we've learned today of what ai i'll just banner it all under ai can do where else can we apply this into this product, into the product that would deliver value that we can actually do faster than we thought we could? So anyone who's ever done eight outbound dialing data sets will be able to do more around controlling and feeding back um, uh, the, the data and you know when, when you stop down, when you're getting used, all the performance metrics. So we can push this throughout the rest of the products. And that was one of the things when we started this project. It wasn't just about building a product, it was about learning a technology. And that technology now is going to go through the rest of the product. So both what Matt said and this excites me because, again, this is, again, I'll go back to this is why we started building software. I always want to be master of our own destiny, deliver value, and we've got some great ideas. It's going to, I'm really excited about the, the things we're going to build over the next 12 months. It's, it's, a, it's a great time to be at a software business. 
Incredible. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the, uh, the, the end of our slightly longer conversation today. So thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Matt, for joining me today. Um, and yeah, thank you, everybody, for listening. It's From my point of view, I'll close off by just saying it's been one of the defining journeys of my entire career up to this point, being involved with this platform. Um, and, and I say that, you know, completely openly and honestly, um, it, it's been really enjoyable to be involved in something that is so new, so intuitive and so fresh um, and to be able to see the results of that um, and, and the output of that. I think that was my light bulb moment was the first time we actually had it all working together and I had the data and I looked at it and my first thought was, ooh, that's interesting. And I'm looking forward to having more of those conversations moving forward. So thank you, everybody, for listening and we will catch you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks. See you again.